What's up, good people of the world? I had a little bit of free time today, which rarely happens, so I decided to make a video, and I was thinking what would be the best use of of this time to give you know you all what you want. And I was thinking of some of the questions that you guys ask about regarding counterpoint, you know, parallels, when is it, when and when not is it okay to voice cross parallels or breaking of those counterpoint rules, string writing, voicing. Um, you know, how to take a melody and harmonize it, you know, how to add melodic interest. Um, a lot of these concepts that I get asked about a lot, and I was thinking this this arrangement that I wrote um, f of the main theme for The Legend of Zelda, which it has a little bit of the main theme and it, ha it has a little bit of Zelda's lullaby in it as well, which some of you might remember. Um, it has a lot of those different types of textures and techniques, and it has some voice cro crossing and it has some parallels. Um, and, it, and it has a lot of different ways of approaching string writing, which is something that a lot of you are interested in. So I thought it might be a good kind of running through this piece and talking about all these different things might be a good bang for your bucks, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so yeah, so I'll just go ahead and play it just to remind you, um, uh, just to remind you how the uh, arrangement goes, and then we'll kind of go through and talk about it, and I'll kind of give some some general. I don't want to say lectures, but some general, we'll go through some general topics about how at least I personally approach four-part writing, four-part writing in the context of strings, voicing, you know, how to create interest in all the parts, but without making it muddy or too busy, um, you know, things like that. <laughs> Fade to uh, niente. Um, yeah, so there, there are a lot of a lot of different um, uh, types of textures in this. Okay, so first the the very beginning. So before before kind of getting into this, um, I do think it's very important to think about how do I synthesize the ideas of four part writing versus counterpoint. And a lot of people can't easily divest one from the other because they say, okay, well, Bach writes chorales with four-part writing and his chorales are very contrapuntal in the sense that they have very nice linear contour and they follow the rules of counterpoint. Um, and uh, at the same time, a lot of Lutheran chorales were written to be particularly easy to sing, so there's a lot of oblique motion in the inner parts and there's not the only real contrapuntal um, um, forces are the outer voices, the soprano and the bass. So there are different styles of four-part writing, but I would say if I if I were to try to give a definition of the the the, the difference in four-part writing versus versus like say four-part counterpoint or even three-part counterpoint, it's it's the fact that there's there's a greater focus on harmonic vertical sonority. Um, and you want the, those vertical voicings to be as nice as possible. You really get a sense of harmonic resonance, and you really get the implication of, of harmonic resonance when you have, you know, the rhythms change. In other words, in four-part writing, you tend to get very clean, well-voiced sonorities, and you have decorative 
Um, with Bach, especially, you have really nice decorative lines in the middle, but they don't tend to hit each other a lot of the time. It's very complementary, and there's a, there are a lot of neighbor tones and passing tones, but the, but the main sort of events are nicely well voiced, and they're ten the harmonic rhythm tends to be a lot slower in counterpoint. If you listen to like a Bach fugue, the harmony, for all intents and purposes, might change on a beat by beat basis, but in most four part writing, the harmony tends to change on a bar by bar basis. So it's more harmonically oriented. Oriented. That doesn't mean that you can't integrate counterpoints into your um, uh, into your music. And basic the basic idea is once notes and I've talked about this before. Once notes start hitting each other, once they happen at the same time, you really have to be careful about the way that you consider the way that they interact with each other. And knowing how to write counterpoint helps you with that. Whereas if, if, if we have this clean vertical sonority and then this voice does something by itself, I don't necessarily have to worry about resolution of dissonance so much because it's oblique motion. The other chords are staying the same, and as long as somehow we get back to our chord or land constantly on the next chord, you, there, the rules for resolving dissonance within the context of a single sonority are not as, as strict, right? Because, you know, again, to use the example that I always use, if, if, I, if I were to play something like this, you know, right? We're passing through a harsh dissonance, right? We're going from an octave to a major seventh to a major sixth. Well, because this lower tone is being held, we perceive it immediately as a consonance, and then it's this dissonance that we pass through. It's very clear that it's a passing tone, whereas if I just play it uh, each if I articulate each sonority, it's perceived as being much more dissonance because the notes, again, to use my sort of, uh, um, uh, for lack of a better word, hitting each other, you know. Right, we really hear that, duh, it really sounds more dissonant to us, and therefore it requires more careful um, resolution in order to not sound like a mistake. Um, so that's that's the main thing. When we have notes that hit each other simultaneously, um, from a harmonic perspective, there's different kinds of harmonic doublings that can work. Um, uh, fifth, uh, sorry, uh, sixth and thirds in in a work work very well. Um, right, voice exchanges also work very well. There's a voice exchange over here. Right, we'll talk about voice exchanges. Um, uh, and uh, and harmonic motion, in other words, staying on the motion of the chord, that works well when the notes hit each other. But once you got, start to get things that are contrapuntal, in the sense that you have different rhythms, or or first species counterpoint, in the sense that um, each part, the lower part, is not just a intervalling doubling of the upper part, which is essentially even when you have thirds and sixths, it's really just you're just enriching a melodic line. Um, uh, once you start, that's when you have to consider the the contrapuntal implications. But anyway, so starting out, um, another thing about string writing is that you, especially with strings, because of their overtone series is so intense, uh, and I, I probably said this before in other videos, you want to make sure that the voicing is as clean and clear as possible, and an open voicing especially tends to sound very nice for strings. And there's a bit of a, uh, a misconception with open voicing. You know, some people tend to think, you know, let's say, well, we'll do something like this, you know. Say, okay, this is open voicing, right? But it's actually not open voicing because the intervals are, are closed intervals, right? Before you invert intervals, they don't, the quality of the interval doesn't change. A minor third is a minor third, whether or not it's expressed as a minor third or a minor tenth, right? Okay, whereas if we invert the interval, if I take this G and move it below the E, it becomes a, a major sixth, right? The, the interval changes, right? So there are prime intervals and non-prime intervals. And each invertal, uh, each interval has an, an open version of itself and a closed version of itself. So we think if we divide an octave into, or if we divide an octave into, you know, all uh, the the twelve intervals that we have, there's a little bit of a polarity um, on the tritone, right? So so any interval that is underneath the tritone, like a fourth, a third. Uh, minor third, or sorry, major third, minor third, major second, minor second, all of those can invert to the intervals that appear above the tritone, right? Um, so, for example, uh, so above the tritone, we have a fifth, we have a minor sixth, major sixth, minor seventh, major seventh, right? And you can see there's, there's an inverse relationship, right? Seventh inverts to a minor second, right? Uh, minor seventh inverts to a major second, etc., etc. Right. So whenever you, in other words, whenever you have um, in, a truly openly voiced chord, you're only going to see intervals that are above the tritone. You're only going to see fifths, sixths, um, and sevenths. Right. If you have seventh chords. Okay. Um, now the 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 
when you're trying to construct an openly voiced chord, the only interval that you do not have to consider whether or not is an open interval is the is between the tenor and the bass, right? Because think about it this way: if I have if I have if I have my melody is on you know let's say um, the note E, and we have a C major chord, right? And I have an openly voiced I have an openly voiced chord, right? Okay. Um, so, right, we have a unison between, or an octave between the viola and the cello, okay, right? So if we, if we take any of these notes and, and sort of invert them down the chord, we'll just, use, we'll just use C minor since C minor is our key signature, right? This is an open sonority, but if I, if I move this down to C, if I move this note down to E flat, if I just invert everything downward, right? Okay, we still have an open interval, we have a fifth between the alto and the bass, but if we go down one more... So let's say if the if the fifth was the melody, right, um, and we build an openly voiced chord downward, right, skip the E flat, go to C, skip the G, go to E flat, right, E flat and C, that is a minor third, right, and that's a closed interval, not an open interval. An interval would be a major sixth, right. So in this case, in certain cases, when the melody line happens to be certain chord chord tones or certain members of the chord you cannot always have an open interval between the tenor and the bass, okay? So that's why what I recommend is start with your bass, right? Which, or, you know, you're usually going to start with your melody, but start with your melody, know how you're going to harmonize it, right? And then write your bass, and then you write the inner parts from the soprano downward to be as openly voiced as possible. Because your voicing perpetuates, right? If you have good, clean motion in the inner parts, if you create a bad voicing at the beginning, you're going to perpetuate that across, and it's going to be difficult to get out of that bad voicing, right? So the idea is that with string instruments, it's going to sound better to have this this uh, voice like this. Right, and I'll go ahead and play that. Um, boop, boop. Oh, we're, I'm trying to do it. Turn it into a whole other one, three, four. This. <laughs> right, it's a richer, nice, cleaner sound than open sound, right, where we basically have a keyboard triad up on top and then a large distance between the viola and the cello. Right, that sounds a lot thinner, right, especially the higher you get, okay? There are some exceptions to this, okay? So, for example, if you have, like, very, very high string stuff, right, you know, stuff like that, which you'll, you'll see in a second, um, uh, you don't always have to have open voicing when you're up there because the overtones, as I always say, are in dog whistle territory, right? So you don't have to worry about the implications of that. And of course, if you're writing very, very low chords, you don't want to use open voicing if using open voicing puts the third low in the bass, right? As we've talked about before, the third, the member of the third of the chord is a very dangerous note to double or to put low because its overtone series least aligns with the, the, the sonority of the chord. You know, like if we're at C major, the third of C major is E, right? Each overtone series produces essentially a major chord on top of it. So we get an E major chord. E major chord is dissonance against C major, so you want to be careful with the third. Okay. Anyway, just just kind of general things to uh, contextualize. You know, the way that I went about the way that I went about um, writing this. Okay. So, um, uh, so from the very beginning, right, right, right. You can see we have this nice big open voicing, right. And I think in this case, even though it does put the third a little bit lower, um, uh, it it gives it a nice. It gives it a really nice, especially this fifth. You know. Um, uh, this this a nice low fifth between cello and bass is, is really nice and usually the cello and bass do double each other Okay, um, and it is dangerous to kind of get them doing individual parts um, But as long as you're careful with the intervals um, You can split up your cello and, and bass and a lot of more modern scoring back in the olden days You know the cello and the bass were actually on the same part and they just completely doubled each other, right? Um, but uh, you know Nowadays, there, we have a lot more independence in between parts. And I think when we start at the beginning as well, because we have this very low, it's, it's four-part writing, right? And we're ignoring or omitting the first violin, right? Because of, the, because of how low this viola part is, if we were to sort of take this whole thing and put it up, you know, put it up an octave, th this stuff would be deeply out of range, right? So in this case, we're splitting the cello and the bass merely because we want to have this low separate four-part writing. And then once we get all these parts, you'll see that the bass generally doubles what the cello does, but the cello adds sort of decorative lines up on top, which can end up with parallels, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it, okay? <laughs> So, and I, 
was thinking about the way that I approached writing this was was from a thinking about the outer voices, and I've, I've expressed before how important it is to think about the outer voices. But if we go straight from C and and how uh, a related on a related note, how important it is to use inverted co chords, right? So if if I just um, uh, went from C minor or in this case C major down to B flat major, and the melody was right, and the bass line was right, it wouldn't it wouldn't be very good contrapuntally. Right, because then we would have a we would have a dissonance, this major second, which then resolves to a an octave, right? And an octave is a very cold interval to have in the outer voices, especially when it's approached by a dissonance, right? So what I chose to do was to have a B flat major in first inversion, so we get the note D, right? And it gives a much warmer, richer sound, and the dissonance gets resolved contrapuntally properly, right? And then um, uh, once we got the D, then I brought it down to a root position B flat and then went down to C because on the micro level, we have these nice thirds, right? We have this D and this B flat, which is a nice major third, which then goes in parallel down to a major third, right? So the way that I'm constructing my bass line and the way that I am choosing um, what inversions to use is, is, is directly out of an effort to make the outer voices in good counterpoint, right? So rather than this... I wrote this. Oh, sorry. Right. Um, and, and it works out nicely because of this function change, too. We get this, this F, right, which is a nice minor third to the D, which then turns into an open fifth, right? So we go from a third to a fifth. Right? And then this fifth turns into a dissonant fourth that needs to be resolved by oblique motion, and then it does resolve by oblique motion to a, to a third, and then we get those parallel thirds. So let me just play those outer voices by themselves. Right, see, see, see how, how, how nice and clean that sounds? Right, and then of course the inner voices have you know parsimonious voice leading, and because of the fact that we're we our harmonic our harmony is going down. Remember when I talked about adjacent chords? If if you want to try and avoid parallels, which you know I don't always, but if you want to try and avoid parallels with adjacent chords, so C and B flat, those are adjacent relationships. Um, if you move the part motion in the opposite direction of the harm harmony, um, because the functions are going to change, you're going to avoid parallelism. Right. In other words, to see if I can illustrate this. Um, um, I don't know if you can see that. Um, I'm just gonna assume you can see this. <laughs> um, if I'm going from C down to B flat, right? Because the harmonic rhythm is downward, if I just move all my parts in that same direction, you're gonna get parallels. You're gonna get parallel fifths, you know, and if you have the uh, the root doubled, you're gonna get parallel octaves or unisons, right? Whereas if I if I if the harmony is going down C to B flat, but my parts are going up, you're gonna have n uh, no parallels, only similar motion, right? And then keep going, right? That type of a thing, right? Um, so that's and that's way in which Bach and a lot of the, the you know the the older fashion composers t avoided parallels with adjacent chords is they always made sure that if the harmony was moving down or up by step the upper three voices were moving in the opposite direction that avoids parallels okay and sometimes that's unavoidable if you have a melody you know that that if your melody and the way that you want it harmonized you know but there are other ways of avoiding parallels and and that's a topic for another video. Anyway, but that's what happens with these parts. The harmony is moving downward, but the inversion is going up, right? scale this is these are basically just as you I'm sure you can notice you know a flat going down to G right so you could consider that parallelism but it's perfectly fine in this case because they're so low and and again I would never under never underestimate neighbor tones and simple passing tones they can add so much color and so much melodic value 
to an inner part, but they fundamentally are not going to mess with your harmony, right? Um, because they always sound like they need to resolve, right? It's still fo <coughs> excuse me, focusing on the A flat, right? So you're still getting really the same voicing, um, uh, but it adds so much. Right? Um, and you'll notice too with things like bowing, like in this case, this is kind of a side note, but you know, I didn't, I didn't bow. Uh, I made sure that there were two, two bow strokes or two slurs in the measure, which is you know, um, uh, in order to be, in order to be able to have this note rearticulated, right? Because you want the down bow to land on the downbeat, right? So da 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 da, right? I wouldn't want to have something like this. Right, because then what would happen is if we had an up bow, right, we'd have a down bow, we'd have an up bow, and then we'd have an up bow and a down beat, right? And you generally, it, unless you have a very good phrasal reason uh, for not doing so, you you want um, uh, up bows to happen on up beats and down bows to happen on down beats because of the the, the way the, you know the fulcrum of the lever inflects it similarly. So because I wanted this note rearticulated, that's why I extended this slur over. That's why there's an asymmetrical slurring um, uh, scheme, asymmetrical slurring scheme. That's fun to say. Um, anyway, yeah, so, so little labor tones really help, right? And actually, on a macro level, we have this sixth, which goes by contrary motion to an octave. So on, on the, on the, sorry, the micro level, on the micro level, it's actually a good counterpoint, even though on the macro level, it technically is parallels. But it's, again, it's all about knowing when and when not, why, you know, why these rules were created so you know when to, when to break them. You don't want to follow them if it makes your music sound worse by following them, right? Um, right? And in this case, I have an incomplete. I have an incomplete chord. It's very, very common whenever you're going to a dominant chord, especially one to five or five to one. Um, uh, you know, it, it get, makes the voice leading nicer if you omit the fifths of one of the chords, and it also can help you avoid parallelisms. So in this case, this um, uh, this uh, E flat pops up to F, and then we get the that's the uh, the seventh the chordal seventh of the chord, and then we get this nice fifth, right? So the the F is F is rendered consonant by the fifth. But all of these upper voices are rendered dissonant by the G that's below, right? So this sounds nice. Right? But at the same time, it's consonant or dissonant based on what's underneath. Right? All of that together. So it, it interlocks. It locks together. Because of the fact that I didn't have the fifth earlier, I can sort of pop down to the fifth, which makes really nice parallel thirds with this, which happens to pop in by oblique motion, right? So this this makes nice counterpoint these little things together. Okay, so this is the main moment when the when the tune is you know fully fully revealed. Um, so. I constructed this very, very carefully. I had several goals, okay? The first goal was that I wanted to add my own touch to it, right? This is a theme everybody's heard for a long time, so I really wanted to kind of make the inner parts and add counterpoint, but that all, I also wanted to be very tasteful. Um, and more importantly than that, I wanted to make sure that none of this distracted from the melody, okay? So that means that anytime I added any sort of counterpoint, it was always rhythmically complementary to the melody, right? Whenever the melody has these holding points, that's when I added the extra detail underneath, as you can see. Um, and, um, and then whenever, whenever my counter lines or underlying things line up with the melody, it's using one of those techniques for reinforcement, you know, like the parallel... <laughs> Parallel sixths, right? Like here and here, and voice exchange, right? So those are things where even though they, it happens at the same time with the melody, it doesn't distract from the melody, it reinforces the melody because it's the same idea perpetuated at a different interval, right? Parallel six, parallel thirds, voice exchanges. Um, and then another thing is this moment right here, yeah, da, 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 right? That's the beautiful moment. That's the, 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 you know, the best part of the tune, I think, that everybody loves. Um, and I really wanted that to have impact, right? And so one of the best ways, um, and I've talked about this before, with which you can add impact is to withhold things before and then give it to them. And because it only happens at that particular moment, um, it gives it more impact by contrast, right? It's sort of kind of like the idea that if you if you don't eat, you know, for an entire day, then when you do eat, the food is going to taste really, really good because you haven't had food in a while, right? It's the same kind of thing. Um, 
so in this case, the bass note, right, this low A flat um, on uh, on the on the double bass. As you can see, I I, I withheld the the downbeat of the low double bass. Yum, boom. And then I gave the downbeat on that specific moment. I specifically withheld the downbeat for the contrabass um, so that it has extra impact during that section. Okay, so let's let's look at that. And, and also this this sort of downbeat is complementary to the melody in the sense that that um, we have this um, you know this G that happens by itself. There's open space, and so it also it also. Um, uh, allows that bass line to be heard and not distract from what's happening above. So let's just play the bass with the melody. Right. Gives it more impact, okay? Um, so, um, so this is really nice. I, I like I like this sort of uh, intervallic function change here, right? The way that the E interacts um, uh, with the C is as a sixth, and it also interacts consonantly with um, uh, the G as a, as a, you know um, uh, as a third. So I just kept it there, but I added a nice little nice little uh, crunchy suspension dissonance, which then resolves back, right? And then and then when this uh, G pops back up to C, since it's a sixth, I can then f sort of follow that upward um, to this uh, um. Uh, uh, you know, to this, to the next note of the chord, right? An open voicing. So that by itself sounds like this. Right. Okay. Um, and, and notice how I held this. I didn't. It's not. Which is what the original version is. Right. Which is another thing. Holding those notes, not holding them. The reason I held all these notes over and didn't and didn't didn't articulate them is so that when I do articulate it over here, it's it has more impact. Right. So it's just implied. Right. Um, so it's all about again withholding things so that you can really use them in a specific spot to try and give it as much impact as possible, okay? Um, so again, let's look at this in terms of rhythmic, um, being complementary rhythmically. This little thing happens while the melody is still, right? And then uh, these two beats that happen with the cello and the, uh, and the viola, okay, just sort of moving up the chord harmonically, um, uh, that happens when there's nothing happen happening on the, the first and second violin. So also tying this note over allows it to not get distracted by the to get distracted by the lower parts. See, everybody has their own metric spot to fill, right? So that together sounds like this. Right? And then with the low bass line coming in. That's another thing you can do is um, uh, uh, a double neighbor tone, right? So escape neighbor tone or whatever you want to call it. Ya, da, da, da. I think it's called the nota cam cambiata, if I remember from my counterpoint studies. Um, when you have a double neighbor like that, like ya, da, da, two dissonances in a row, but approached by a leap as long as they're both neighbors. So you can go ya, da, 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 or ya, da, 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 right? So it's again, it's an easy way to... It's an easy way, and it happens because this note is held. It happens while nothing else is happening, right? You can see it when this cello has their little line. There is literally no one else on that rhythmic space filling that up, right? And then the same thing here. Just little neighbor tones like that. They don't screw with the harmony. They don't make have any contrapuntal implications or complications, I should say, um, right? And then we continue this third thing, right? Then we pop down into octave, right? And then down to a third, right? This is a major third, C and A flat. And then we get a voice exchange, right? So I don't know if you remember. I don't. I, I'm not actually sure I've ever talked about voice exchange. I may have, but a voice exchange is where you have a, a, an interval, and then you have its inversion. So C on top, A flat on bottom. In this case, a major third inverts to a minor sixth. C on bottom, A flat on top, and you pass through it by way of an octave. And because the octave is passed and left by contrary motion, um, it doesn't break any counterpoint rules. And since you're just switching the voicing, it sounds really nice. Right, which is nice. Okay, so that sounds like this. 
Just these two voices interacting. <laughs> And then this little little inner voice, let's see. A little passing tone here, right? And because this D is dissonant indeed with the chord un underneath it, right? It's a dissonant sort of Lydian suspension. It doesn't sound particularly dissonant, again, because nothing is happening on top of it, right? Um, uh, the C is being held. This, this, uh, this C is being held, right? Um, and that's another thing, uh, an intentional decision that I made. When this... Uh, C drops down to A flat, we get A flat, we get A flat. Once this E flat pops down to D, we don't get another E flat in the chord. So I have eliminated some of the dissonance. And that ya da da. Right, because we have the E flat, we get a minor second. Very dissonant, right? But if we just have an incomplete chord, it sounds like this. Right? All we have is the tritone, right? And I have no problem with the tritone. To me, the tritone sounds a lot less dissonant than like a minor second. So that's another reason for um, uh, not sort of like leaving this second violin on the uh, on the fifth. But if I pop it down to the third, right? Not only does that allow me to do a voice exchange with the first and second violins, but it also makes this dissonant dissonance less striking by by um uh, you know um uh, by uh, um, uh, avoiding that that close close tonal clash, right? And then what happens here, right, um, is by doubling the third, um, uh, I'm giving it a... I'm doing two things. One, doubling the third, especially when it's a high up doubling, isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as all other members of the chord present. It just gives it a very chocolatey sound. When you double it low or where you don't have other chord members present, um, uh, it can be very muddy, especially if you leave it that way. Um, but it, by doubling the third, it can actually be really nice. In fact, uh, D Debussy does this a lot when he has a major seventh chord, right? He'll have, you know, E flat major seven, um, and he'll have something like this. Right. Right. So you're omitting the fifth, right? And then you have the seventh, right? And then you have the third that's actually doubled, right? Um, uh, and that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't um, sound bad. But anyway, I immediately pop the C down to A flat. So also the fact that we have the third doubled, and then we go down and double this A flat that the, that the cello the bass is playing an octave above, it makes that clean and warm by the very fact that I doubled the third. So again, this, this constant relationship of contrast. Um, so that sounds like this. Right, do you see how that happens? It starts out almost like, like chocolatey and juicy and muddy and just full of emotion, and then it sort of turns into this purified kind of grand thing, right? Because the voicing goes from this kind of, from this to, 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 to you know, pure. Get this little um, uh, ya da da, ya da 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 da. And that's another important thing is I want to make all these 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 uh these uh, inner voices as um uh, melodic as possible, right? So if we just sing like the viola here. So, but anyway, so yeah, and, and I don't consider this, uh, I don't consider a major seventh like this as requiring resolution. Normally that would resolve upward, yadam, right, yadam, and, and I actually do resolve that typically up here, right? But if you go to another chord tone, you don't actually have to resolve it because you're giving the sense that it is a major seventh chord. And if it's a major seventh chord, and that major seventh is not just a suspension or dissonance that requires resolution because in a major seventh chord, D is a part of the chord. It sounds like a harmonic tone and it doesn't require resolution. But you do have to go to another note of the chord. If I went from a D to like, you know, I don't know, to a to a, a C or something, that it is a stepwise resolution, um, uh, but the C doesn't belong to the chord, and we didn't pr play the C at the beginning of the chord, so we don't know that it's like an E flat add six or 13 chord. Um, uh, you know, we wouldn't hear it as a chordal sonority. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Feel, again, feel free to ask questions in, in the comments about any of this. Right? <laughs> Right, and this is also nice because we don't have the third. We get the third um, uh, 
This is another reason it, that I, I added the seventh here is because the seventh makes this nice um, uh, sh um, imperfect consonants, B flat to D is a minor minor sixth, right? That sounds really nice. If, if we were to play this um, melody without the third, um, uh, like this, it sounds very empty without the third at the beginning, right? Right, and I wouldn't necessarily want to have a third in another chord um, or another part of the chord because then what would I do with that third? Because the, the melody is not on the third, it's on the fifth, and then it pops down to the third, and then whatever else was playing the third then has to do something. I mean, not a lot of options there, right? Should I sort of go down to an E flat? Should I pop up to a voice exchange? I already did a voice exchange earlier, so I didn't want to do it. In fact, I think I tried that and I didn't like it. So what I decided to do was add the, um, was add, um, uh, add this major seventh, right? Right. Right, and because that imperfect consonance gives us a sense of tonality, even though it doesn't necessarily belong to the triadic structure of the chord, um, uh, it, it it cleans up, or I shouldn't say it cleans up, it it warms up the sonority without me having to put the third in there. So again, that's that's the important thing is when you encounter these problems, you know, like the voices don't want to line up, or the counterpoint doesn't work out, or you, you, the harmony wants to do something, but the melody won't, when, there are multiple solutions to these problems. You shouldn't just think, oh, this is my stock solution to this problem. You have multiple solutions, and you want to choose the one that fits the best in in the in that possible scenario, right? So we get the fifth here, and then we get this. Yeah, da, 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 which is basically just a bunch of fancy neighbor stuff, right? We have this with this this um uh, appoggiatura, which is basically just a nine eight, and right, and then goes bunch of neighbor stuff, right? Those are all chord tones, right? And it works nicely with this with this fourth above, right? I mean, a fourth is considered a dissonance at the two part counterpoint level, but considering that this D is is quite dissonant with the E flat, right? It, it it's not super bad with the with the uh, with the uh, fourth, right? And then we get um, uh, a nice sixth, right? And then, right, um, that's when that dissonance comes in, okay? So this, this by itself sounds like this. Right, and then again, once we get to here, we get this fourth, which is, which is quite, quite dissonant, dissonant, but then the fourth resolves um, uh, up to the, uh, up to the third of the chord, right, okay? Um, and I actually, I did a, I did a reharmonization here. Um, uh, yum, yum, ba -da -da -da. actually, no, I think it does do that in the original. Let me see. Yeah, it does use that, um, uh, modal mixture there, uh, this D, D flat major chord, but we'll get there in a second. I want to talk about the counterpoint. Okay. Now let's look at how these relate to each other, right? We get this nice um, third here, dee, 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 right, right, and then when when this F pops down to D, right, I, I want to avoid parallels, so the D pops down to B flat. So on a large scale, we really just have parallel parallel thirds, which are separated by the rhythm, right? And normally, I'm not a huge fan of adding adding dotted rhythms on top of triplets, or you know, two on three or four on three is really what this is. Because because it's a little bit awkward, but um, since it's so slow, it doesn't sound awkward to me in this particular case. It just sounds like, it sounds almost like a human thing. We, we, we don't hear the metrical relationship, especially the fact that this note is held over, right? So this sounds like this. Right. We get this nice fifth here. Right, we get this fourth. Right, and this this E flat is consonant um, uh, with this uh, with this G, right? Okay, um, even though it's dissonant with the uh, even though it's dissonant with the um, uh, with the the seventh of the chord, right? So the, it, this cushion dissonance, right? If something relates dissonantly to what it, um, to what's above it intervallically, it should relate consonantly to what's below it, and vice versa. Um, this means that even though you can have a lot of dissonance in the chord, each dissonance is sort of comforted or backed up, so to speak, by another part, right? So they all sort of work together like these these interconnected building blocks. So all that structure together sounds like this. Right. And again, when you have a lot of when I have a lot of motion up here, simplify the bass, right? right we just have this fifth down here, fifth sir. Stabilizing, as Jacob Collier likes to say. Right, and same thing here.
here. We don't get the third of the chord immediately. Um, yeah, it's not the third of the chord. I'm thinking this is F minor, but it's actually actually D flat, right? Right. But it is a it is a fourth, right? Which does require resolution, and then it resolves up to a um, it resolves up to a minor sixth, right? And now that we have the fifth of the chord, we don't need it here, so then we can sort of pop down. And this is where I did some voice crossing because I wanted the viola to be able to pop out, right? So, so um, I immediately crossed the viola above the second violin, um, so that the viola can pop out and have its line. And then I sort of had them pop down um, back. So this this is this is a little it is a little notey, um, but but just listen to how the structure works. So we have these thirds here. Right, and these fourths are okay because it's sort of like a, it's like a quasi uh, Fobardon thing um, where you have like inverted, first inverted parallel chords, right? So parallel fourths were actually an 18th century counterpoint, okay. Um, you know, like. But they just didn't like them by themselves. You needed to have the uh, the third, right? But they did stuff like that all the time in Baroque, Renaissance, and, and late Renaissance and classical music. Um, uh, anyway, right? Yeah. So. Right. Right. And then we pop down again. So I I don't continue to voice cross them. I'm clear about that, right? This G pops up to a G, and, and even though the leaps are large, I try to make it as coherent as possible, right? For example, like... Right, so when I make leaps, I'd like to return down my step, right? So they, they have individually nice lines. that at once, right? And that's another important point is that once a note gets some sort of resolution, even when you go back to the original note, you don't actually need to resolve it again. You can immediately move on to the next sonority. It just requires, it want, it needs some resolution before you can move on to the next next sonority, even if that resolution doesn't coincide with the beginning of the next interval, right? It's kind of a counterpoint thing. Right, and then we get this fifth. And then again, while a note is being held, you're pretty much free to do any sort of you know stuff above. You don't have to worry about resolution of, of dissonance as long as it, you know, the general contour and main beats of that line makes sense with the harmony, um, which is all basically just outlining this. This basically five of five um, uh, kind of harmonic sonority. And again, all this bass stuff is really simple. Just have a doubled C, right? Pops up an octave, then this C is rearticulated. So this is all really just doubling. I'm just switching up the octaves to kind of keep it fresh, but that's it's strictly doubling, which is why I wouldn't consider that, oh, parallels, you know, because they're really the, on the same part, right? And then that pops down into fifths, right? Which then turns into, turns back into an octave, okay? So now let's look at how this line, this lower line relates to just the melody by itself. Because that's important with counterpoint. Um, you don't just want to consider, oh, okay, how does first violin sound against second violin, and then how does second violin sound against viola? You want to consider how every part sounds against every part. So let's um, uh, start maybe back here and, and, and pay attention to the viola and the violin. Consonances, right, and then really, right here we have a third, which 
pops down by a neighbor tone, but it really is just parallel thirds, right? So you can disguise the parallel thirds and give them sort of their unique contour, and we don't perceive this necessarily as, as sort of like directly influencing what's above it because it is down apart, right? Um, uh, although I guess it is voice crossing up above. But anyway, bottom line is, do not underestimate the power of having parallel thirds and sixths. Whenever you have things happening at the same time, you know, uh, they're the same rhythm, you know, like Bach does it all the time. Parallel thirds and sixths are, are great, right? So we get this. basically just a giant deceptive cadence. Right. And I, I, I actually I don't use proper resolution of this deceptive cadence because I'm not a fan of it. Um, well, I, sh I should probably explain that for... I don't want to bore those of you who have like studied theory extensively. But when you have a... I hope you guys can see this. Um... When you have a deceptive cadence, so a deceptive cadence is 5 6, right? So if we're in the key of C minor, deceptive cadence would be G to A flat. And it's usually G7, right? So, right, you're sort of fooling them going to 6 instead of 1. Um, I particularly like, I particularly like this sound, you know, like, for example, um, um, Tonight, the song Tonight from West Side Story. Today, or before the world was just an address. Right, that's one of my favorite news. <laughs> Lots of deceptive cadences in that. And that's where I really first discovered the deceptive cadence. But anyway, irrelevant historical information. Um, because of the fact that you're going from G to A flat, right? You have a propensity for these parallel fifths which you want to try and avoid, okay? Um, if we go downward to try and avoid the parallel fifths problem, like we do, you know, if we move in the opposite direction of the harmonic motion, like we talked about before, you get this augmented second between the uh, B and the A flat, right? Or they didn't like that. It's not particularly good voice leading, right? Um, you might like to use it stylistically. I mean, I use augmented seconds all the time when they're required, but it, the, it, the voice leading kind of messes up. So what they like to do is omit the fifth, um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, there are a couple ways to solve this problem. You can omit the fifth of, of the chord, of the G chord, and just go like this. Right, then you, then you avoid, you have this, yeah, this leading tone, which once resolve upward, the bass goes from G to A flat like it's supposed to, and then you get the seventh that once resolve down, it does. Right. That's good. That's great. But that's three part, right? How do you deal with four parts, right? Okay. Like, so if you have four parts like this, what usually happens is this goes down by a third, this goes up, and you end up getting this doubled third in the middle, right? You double the third. Um, and, and that's one of the few cases, you know, when they teach you in four-part writing, oh, don't double the third except in special cases. Well, that's one of those special cases, right? You, you double the third. There's also when you're working with fully diminished seven chords and how to resolve them, there's a case where you double the third. Anyway, all that I'm trying to say is that I don't give a rip about this in this context. I, I don't, the, the parallels don't bother me um, in this, this thing, so I just went ahead and, and went with it, okay? So, I, again, I know my goal. I know I'm getting to this next section. And, in fact, I started writing this section before I finished this section. So that helps me to know where I want to land, right? I want to land there. I want to land there. You know, octave. And basically what's happening here is I'm sort of setting up this Zelda's lullaby, okay? Um, uh, so... The progression of Zelda's Lullaby is uh, that descending uh, thing. Right, you know, I use it all the time. You guys uh, point that out. Right, I love it. Great progression. And the reason I love it is because it's literally Zelda's Lullaby. Right. Um, so because it's a direct progression of Zelda's Lullaby, you sort of start out with this progression harmonically foreshadowing um, Zelda's Lullaby, okay? And now we get into sort of a different style of string writing, but I want to pay attention to how um, I sort of lead there, right? Okay, the, this F dropping down into VC to this A flat, that's the only leap. Everything else leads nicely by step, right? And octave jumps are okay. So, boom, boom, right? And again, this... 
this this parallelism right here I think is okay um, uh, because of the nice voice anyway um, right uh, same thing here notice how I drop out the parts one by one first I drop out the bass then I drop out this low cello right because I want to drop out the I I, I don't it, it would sound awkward if I just suddenly went to this high thing and the bass immediately dropped out you kind of have to gradually gradually um, uh, uh, do it so l listen listen to that the bass drop. Some, uh, so the idea is, there's just basically just this open, right, that's that's the large scale structure, right, which is basically just, again, okay, so how do I decorate this? Well, first thing, you can see there's open voicing, right, it's not, it's not, it's not this, which I could have done, which I do actually do later. Um, it's this open voicing, right? And that means that this E flat can pop up here, do a bit of voice crossing, and it, we're actually changing the voicing from open voicing to keyboard voicing, um, and it doesn't confuse um, uh, the melodic parts. Again, with voice crossing, you want to be careful to not sort of confuse the contour of the line, but because this E flat is essentially right here, right? That's where that E flat is happening, and an E flat happens on the second beat, right? The melody is E da da da, e -a -da, -da. Right, um, uh, so I took advantage of that extra space and filled it in, but in a way that didn't actually interfere with the harmony. And then this nice little E flat and, and F, right? You get that little crunch, right? But then it resolves to an open octave, right? It's not like they go and turn into unison and then it'll become thin, right? So that sounds like this. Parallel or with a sequence like this, when you create a nice little, uh, you know, structure like that, you can re-perpetuate it, and it generally sounds pretty good, right? And then I'm uh, this melody is so I generally like to have um, uh, opposite contour, right? So they land on the same note, but they start with a fifth, right? So it's sort of like a quasi voice exchange in the sense that they're not actually exchanging, but there is. It is another way to get consonants. Um, uh, um, consonants. It's basically like this. Right? They land on that. They land on that uh, note, which kind of also makes it pop up by the texture by, by virtue of its doubling. So that sounds like this. Right. And actually, I displaced it. Right? I remember doing this. I remember displacing it because it sounded a little cold to immediately go to that interval. So when you displace it, you add dissonance, but since it still resolves the way it wants to, you aren't breaking any rules of counterpoint. So that's another great trick to use, is you can take two consonances, right? And if you displace one of them, you create a dissonance, but because you're just displacing it and it still resolves the way it would have resolved, you're not actually going to break a rule of counterpoint. So it's a great way of adding detail without worrying about that detail muddying things up, if that makes any sense at all. Right, then with the middle harmonic parts. Right. And you notice there's a balance of rhythm here. There's this quarter, half quarter, and then these parts are on half quarter, quarter, right? right. And what is this? Parallel fifths. Hey, look at that. Okay, so this is important. This is this is an important reason to break parallel fifths. Right? Um, because of the amount of contrary motion that I have, it doesn't detract from the independence of the parts. And because of the fact that this is a third of the chord, right, and this is the seventh of the chord, we're not actually on the fifth of the chord, these parallels are not perceived vertically because each of the notes individually have this nice seventh and, and sixth relationship, not a sort of cold fifth or tonic root relationship. Um, uh, they don't sound um, by virtue of their vertical sonority to be fifthy, if that makes sense. They don't sound like really cold like parallel fifths normally do. And because of the fact that they each have their own nice individual melodic contour, da, 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 and you'll notice that um, um, I immediately changed off and split the cellos um, into their other line, which moved opposite. So it doesn't detract from the independence. 
and it because of the fact that they're so far away from each other you don't hear the vertical nature of the parallel fifths and because of their function in the chord so in this case i was like yeah there's to me in this case there's no logical reason why i should avoid parallel fifths for the sake of avoiding parallel fifths so again it's it's a, it's about don't ever feel bound by the rules just understand the rules and they're very helpful and they can speed along your process because you don't have to like reinvent the wheel and think about everything all the time every time you go and write something um, uh, but if you you know always question them in other words is it a good idea for me to use this for me to use this this uh, this rule here um, uh, so and then this cello line I really focused on making giving it a good contour <laughs> That has that thing, right? And then it really starts spilling out. We get this, we get this, this, this fifth sort of splits into thirds, right? Right? So then this E flat pops out where it needs to be because I, I want to get this nice full complete chord. So usually I'll start with the incomplete thing and build it to a complete. That's a better idea than starting with complete and then sort of melodically moving out, right? So yeah, right? Splits back out to open voicing. Right, you see how it splits back out to open voicing, right? And then yada, that's a suspension that resolves. Really juicy. And again, nice thirds, parallel thirds, right? And then this sort of preemptive fifth, which is leading to the next chord. All of this stuff together sounds like this. how I'm, I'm withholding this resolution. I want this last one because it's so simple and because all the other voices just kind of just move down the way they do in the actual song. That's why I withheld this resolution. I held this viol over in a suspension. I held the cello even longer in a suspension and then gave it this sort of triple like it's hesitant. It's hesitant to accept this fact, right? And then when we finally get just the actual normal blanket statement, it has, has, has more impact because we withheld it first. course that's just harmonically straight out straight out of the original right I just did a little change of inversion here right and then in order to fill in the extra gap I didn't want to I didn't want to add any melodic anything I just wanted I just wanted this to be like pure harmony reinforcing the melody on top um, so that's why this G just pops down to another chord tone right and then it goes and the reason I voice cross it above the second violin is so we got these nice octaves, right? This, this uh, uh, G flat to uh, an F um, uh, is not is a dissonant interval, and it wouldn't sound very good melodically, linearly. So I pop it up an octave, and then it nicely pops down. You know, when you pop up, you could have to come back down by step. It does to the F, right? And then this is just an octave, right? So that's another good reason to voice cross, is if it makes the voice lyric nicer. And again, this this because there's this empty space, I want I want to keep the pulse going till the very end, right? Um, uh, so that's why I fill in this, right? Right, and then we get everything changes on the same time, right? So complementary rhythms. I love the way
way, Kondo wrote that with this, 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 the suspension resolves downward, but that's the only thing. It just slips by a half step, but it's, it, that half step is so moving. It's only one little part, just, those little suspensions, man. So good. Um, anyway, and then by big contrast, we want to hear the climax of the melody, but just like, um, it's sort of a tribute to, you know, Ocarina of Time, when you finish the game, there's this big scene with the, with the, uh, with the sword, where he puts the sword back in, and there's the giant, ja -dum! tubular bells in the background, boom, 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 you know, it's this big epic ending, and it's like the end, right, and then you think, okay, that's over, this is epic ending, and then it sort of calms down. And then it goes back, and he just walks back and sees the princess for the first time when they were kids, right? And then just the melody plays an ocarina by itself with a simple accompaniment. And then they look at each other, and then it just fades to sepia. You know what I mean? Like, that's so moving to me, the fact that it just goes from this huge thing to this quiet. It's, it's almost like an E.T., too, where you have this big, this big giant, you know, build up, and then... I'm Piccolo with Harp and Celeste looking at E.T., right? Those contrasts can be really really powerful so yeah so this this uh is just pizzicato doubling what the cello is doing to give it a nice light feel i don't want the bass to be super heavy right um uh, and and uh, it's just simple accompaniment more like of a pianistic accompaniment and notice how um uh, when the melody had activity in the later half of the bar i didn't bother adding any i didn't bother adding any sort of embellishments but then when the melody chills on a half note that's when i add that right so again you don't want to distract from the melody but you do want to fill in space if it needs to be filled in and the reason i did use the cello here is because it was out of the range of the violas Um, uh, and that's the little harp thing. Oh, sorry. That's the little turnaround that leads back to the original song. Um, anyway, so I know it's kind of a lot of, you know, talking about a lot of different things at once and not particularly organized um, as far as videos are concerned. But I hope that helps. To me, like, like seeing rules, learning how rules are applied to when you're writing music is what's important because you learn all this theory and you learn all these rules and you're, it just, it can like bind you up or you can just kind of want to throw them out the window. So like, you know, um, how, at least for my personal, you know, subjective process, how I think about, you know, counterpoint and harmony and when to subvert certain rules in order to achieve, you know, what's most hierarchically important based upon. And the bottom line is, what are you trying to express? You know what I mean? What's the emotional undercurrent of what you're trying to express? What's your goal with the piece? And then you know what to pull out um, to express that. You're not just using techniques for the sake of techniques. Music is not an intellectual um, endeavor. It's an emotional endeavor that is um, accomplished by, you know, intellect. Um, so... Um, yeah. So yeah, I hope you got something out of that video. Um, as always, let me know if you have any questions about um, anything. Um, I might post the score to this in PDF on, on, on Box. So yeah, I look forward to Christmas break and, and uh, making more videos. Um, uh, like I, I've said previously, I've just been super busy um, with college. Um, so, but working on the second movement of my symphony, that'll be uploaded fairly soon. I also have got a recording of the first movement of my symphony, which I'm excited to upload. And a piece I wrote, A Rhapsody for Violin and Piano, which I just got a recording of. I've got a lot of stuff that is just waiting to get uploaded, so um, stay tuned for that. Anyway, as always, thanks for the support. Thanks for watching. I will see you all later.